this slide really just highlights some of the terminology. You always have one outcome in general linear model. There's one thing you're trying to analyze, and that will be called an outcome or a dependent variable. And then everything this side is called an independent variable, or sometimes these are called the effects in the model. That's just sort of get you used to the terminology. Sometimes when people write up publications, they talk about, yes, these were the independent effects or the independent variables or, or effects in the model. So they're always the things that are on the right-hand side but being tested, and then the outcome is the thing you're interested in analysing. In our examples, well, the very first another example was looking at gene expression, comparing between the different genes, and so the outcome would be expression and the independent variable would be gene. In our regression example, we were looking at predicting white blood cell count from platelets, so white blood cell count would be the outcome and platelets would be the independent, well, the so-called independent variable. So that was just a bit of terminology, that's nothing new. So the key features of general linear models, I hadn't specifically mentioned this today, but um, I did mention it last time that you do assume that the errors are normally distributed when you do an analysis of variance and also regression. And the same is the case for the general linear model. You're thinking about data where you assume that the errors or the outcomes are normally distributed. If the outcomes themselves, these measurements, are normally distributed, you'll be OK. But it, the assumption is actually that the errors are normally distributed. And they're the things that ideally should be checked. You could have any number of variables on this right-hand side of the equation. And they can be binary variables where there's two possible outcomes. They might be several categories <coughs> or continuous variables. Yeah, I mentioned that t-tests, pair t-tests are all actually encompassed in the broad sort of umbrella of general linear models, as is ANOVA regression and analysis of covariance. Hopefully from that you'll realise there are a broad class of models which, if you can assume your errors are normally distributed there, They've got many uses and a lot of flexibility in what you can deduce from your data using general linear models, so definitely worth making use of. So yeah, thinking about that assumption that the errors are normally distributed, sometimes these errors are called residuals, so um, that's just another bit of terminology to bear in mind. Both expected to be normally distributed and also to have similar variance over the range of variables and predicted values. And usually the way people check this is using something called a residual plot. And that's simply a plot of residuals against their predicted values. I'll show one in a minute. There's also this uh, other type of plot called a normal plot. And that checks the normality a bit more closely. And it's a plot of residuals against their expected values given their ranks. So the values you would expect them to be if they had a normal distribution. So for this example, these were just this plot here. This is a residual plot. So these are the predicted values from the model, and the um, residuals are plotted against those predicted values. And there's a bit of an art to sort of interpreting these plots, but what you want to see is that um, there's no evidence of a really sort of pattern in these in this data, and that they're sort of reasonably similarly distributed regardless of what the value of a predicted mean is. So here, there's nothing odd going on. It'll also help you highlight if there's any outliers in the data. I mean, obviously, you're always going to get a lowest or a highest value, but none of these values are sort of really got residuals that are much smaller or much higher than the others. So that was acceptable. And this is the normal plot of the residuals against their expected values, given their ranks. And you want that to follow roughly a straight line. It'll never follow exactly a straight line, but as long as it doesn't deviate too much. So that was acceptable for this study too. This is something that uh, you kind of develop a, an eye for. Some of the packages give the actual tests of normality, <coughs> but you need to watch with those because if you've got a small data set, they'll never come out as significant. If you've got a large data set, you might find that they significantly test non-normality, but it's such a small difference from not being normal. It really doesn't affect the results very much. So best to sort of look at residual plots and develop an eye for sort of assessing if there's anything untoward going on.
in this example, I was happy that um, for the analysis, the errors were suitably distributed to do the general linear model. Um, but of course, sometimes you'll be in a situation where they're not, the model isn't suitable. So you could then consider a transformation of the outcome variable. You could try taking logs, for example. You could look for the outliers, think about whether you can justify taking them out. It's important to justify taking them out and know that actually that value was wrong. You can't just say, well, it's a bit low, so I'll take it out. If you can't justify taking it out, you could try analysing the data with it in and with it out and seeing if it makes a big difference. And then, of course, if the data, you can't transform them to be normal, you can't sort of get rid of your, justify getting rid of any outliers, you might have to resort to non-parametric techniques. And we looked at some of those last time, the Wilcox and Rank sum test for comparing two groups of non-normal data. Criscal Wallace was the equivalent of analysis of variance for non-normal data. And Spearman Rank correlation coefficient or regression can be used if you've got two continuous measurements where at least one of them's non-normal. But of course that's a lot more restrictive. We can't kind of allow for structure and fit several effects in a model for non-normal data as we can in the general linear model. But if it's the only thing that you can use because your data are non-normal, you'll just have to you know, work with the simpler tests that you can base on your data. A couple more general points. When uh, deciding on which general linear model to do, you've got a number of choices available. You can sometimes choose which variables you might want to adjust for. You might, you, you can choose whether or not I'm going to address a particular interaction. You can decide whether you're going to test within subgroups. So it opens up a lot of different choices and there's flexibility for sort of fitting loads of different models and sometimes there might be a temptation to try lots of things until something's significant, but that really isn't a good way to go because you're then multiple testing and the more you try different things, the more likely you are eventually to find something significant by chance. So I think it's important to define your research question in advance and suit the analysis, you know, choose one analysis that suits that best and don't fish around too much by experimenting with too many models.